So, uh, computing, as Salim said, does underlie a lot of the exponential revolutions that go on. And I'm going to explain that in one of the later talks. But one that's is coming in network bandwidth, the thing that connects us all today. Network bandwidth actually consists of a variety of different technologies, and the most important in terms of speed is what goes through the ground, namely fiber optics. Now, every year there's a new record by people who build fiber optics as to how much data they put down. And a recent record for a small bundle of fibers was a hundred, uh, sorry, so it was a petabit, a petabit down a small bundle of fibers. Now, what is a petabit? It's not a number you ordinarily use. That could put 100 billion people on the phone at the same time using the lousy phone codex we have in our cell phone. With it is. And how remarkable it is that today, phone companies are still trying to charge you per minute for long distance minutes when bandwidth has become that cheap in the ground. But doing it in the ground is not enough. We want to send it through the air over short and long distances. Over short distances, a new technology, which actually is going to make its way into satellites soon as well, is called free space optics. Now, it means it can only go a certain distance. It can have issues with the fog. There's also, however, a technology called terahertz radio that can do high-speed bandwidth. So free space optics can get up to about 160 gigabits today, and gigabits are a number you've probably heard. And terahertz radio, about um, 30 gigabits. So I think there's the potential for short space networking at very high speeds as well. We also have to network inside the room itself, and that is, again, very different. But one thing we've discovered is that when you use very high frequencies, which don't go through walls, you think that's a disadvantage. I cannot connect to the wireless ac access point in the next room, and I have to put in another one in the next room. So you can have a gigabit of radio bandwidth in this room, and they can have a different gigabit of radio bandwidth in the next room, and a different gigabit in the other room next to us. And that means you can have an arbitrary amount of close in bandwidth by making the cells smaller and smaller. This gentleman here has done research putting bandwidth into light beams. Light is actually good at carrying information. And as you can tell, it doesn't go through the walls very well at all, even less than the radio does. And that means you can have, in fact, individual gigabits to individual people in the room when you work with things like light beams. And then we also have to get connectivity over the wide area with mobile devices and so on. What we do today with cell phones and other technologies. This is Marty Cooper, who built the first mobile phone, which you see there in Catherine's hand. Um, it was a little bit larger than the ones we have today, but the, many of the principles are the same. However, one thing that has changed since that era, which I now call the 1900s, doesn't that sound far in the past? Back in the 1900s, how they did it was the government sold monopolies on frequencies to various companies and carriers or gave them to TV stations or the military. And this is a company, and on yellow to another company, and blue to another company, and saying, you who have bought this, you're the only one who can use green light to talk. Everyone else can't use green light, they've got to use a different color. That's the way we allocate this resource today. And it is very seductive to the governments because they get to charge billions of dollars for these monopolies, and the people who buy the monopolies are also pleased because they can have exclusive access to something. But the truth is, we've made Thanks to computers, we've made radios much smarter than they were, much faster. We've made them have the ability to see what's going on in their environment, to notice what bands are being used, to notice how much power is being used, to notice how far away the thing they're talking to is. And because of that, they can change their frequency, change their power, change their antenna, and they can share this spectrum that's around us vastly more efficiently than that method from the 1900s of pre-allocating it to these, excuse me, these companies. In fact, several years ago in the United States and now in other countries, they realized that in every town there are about 60 TV channel slots, at least here. It varies from country to country. But 60 TV slots and only about 10, 20 TV stations in a typical town broadcast over there, which, by the way, nobody is watching anymore because they all have satellite or they all have cable. But these slots exist and nobody's using them. But because they're allocated to this, nobody gets to take advantage of it. So it was proposed that we allow people to use what they call the white space, the spaces in between, and make radios that were smart. And the radios would just say, okay, here I am, and I'm uh, in this town, and I am uh, forgot to turn off the, uh, uh, there you go, that's not bad of me. That's the first time that's happened, I'm a bad boy. Anyway, they don't have these white spaces were there, and the radio can say, oh, look, I'm in San Francisco, and here are the channels here, and I see this channel is empty and I'll just use that. And if that channel starts getting a TV station on it, it's not going to happen, but if it does, 
notice it, and then it ends. So remarkably, you can get much more bandwidth than we did the old way, but the paddle, it turns out, is going to be political. And now let's expand even further beyond that area, the, tower, the cell tower. You understand it's audacious and crazy. They called it Project Loom when they announced it to the world a few months ago. The way this project works is they put up balloons into the stratosphere, well above where jet aircraft fly. And up there, you've got a great view of the ground, and the wind blows fairly hard, and you cannot stay in one place very easily up there. But what you can do is if you can change the pressure in your balloon, you can go up and go down, and you can find winds that move at different speeds. So at different layers, there are winds going east, and some winds going west, and so on. So what the team is doing, in addition to making these balloons, is trying to make an algorithm that can map the winds of the world and give commands to the balloons so that they will position themselves in a roughly even spacing as they drift over a continent. Then when they get to the edge of the continent, they will find the fastest wind they can find and go across the ocean in as few days as possible and then cover the next continent. Now, they believe if they can get the balloons to stay up for about 100 days, and they haven't done that yet, um, they can make an effective solution. They're up to about 50 days right now. Although they recently announced they did get one balloon to go around the world entirely in the Southern Hemisphere in under 25 days. So uh, there's a fair bit of wind up there. Anyway, why is this important? Well, you're on the internet, I'm on the internet. Two and a half billion people are on the internet, but there are seven billion people in the world. And those other four and a half billion people, um, they might be able to buy a satellite phone, but they're not the sort of people who can afford satellite phones. And because of that, they have no connection. And the whole world, more than two-thirds of the world, is waiting to get the same things that you've all taken for granted now and your children have never seen the world without it. The rest of the world is waiting for that. Um, so there, you can now see on your screen, and I'm going to apologize because whenever we do this, we get a bit of delay in the wireless transfer of this image from my screen to you. Um, but it sits there on this, uh, it's, in there. it's already been a few seconds now, too. You see the home screen of it. So this is what I see sort of sitting above my field of vision up here. And uh, we have a few of these around here. You'll get a chance to play with it if you want to later. And I can talk to it and say, OK, class, take a picture at all times, uh, things that you might like to know, like here's the weather here. Um, and uh, let's go over. We can see the history. But actually, what I'll do is I'll do a search if you like. Um, again, we've got a bit of delay going on here. OK, class, Google. Images of cats. All right. Well, you're you're quite a bit behind because I'm already I'm already looking at them. Now I do this search for you, and you should see it. Come on, be good. Thank you. <laughs> I do this for you because you may not have been aware of this, but the internet is actually full of cats. Um, <laughs> nobody is nobody is too surprised. Uh, and another thing that uh, this new app that just started up, I'm going to pop up, and we'll see how well we can make this work. Um, OK, Glass, translate this. All right, so yeah, the quicker didn't move this, but I have it on a piece of paper. So I'm going to hold up this fine piece of paper with some Russian on it in front of my eyes here. And as it is with demos, it didn't. There we go, let me try it again and get a little straighter. There we go. Do you see it yet? Yeah, because I'm not seeing what you're seeing. Uh, oh, okay, you're, you're seeing it, it get confused uh, back and forth about the words. So we'll do it again. I see it working great, but of course. All right. So, uh, uh, I put up Russian now because, well, there's probably a few of you here who could actually read that, but most of you saw just a lot of Cyrillic letters, and so that's how it works. So, a whole bunch of interesting technologies. We're going to also come to understand just how the internet got us here, how an exponential revolution really works, and a lot of other good topics. So I look forward to talking to you throughout the week about all these things. <laughs>